Good afternoon, everybody. Today we're going to talk about how to build a virus. And just like we did when we talked about genomes, we're going to try and simplify it. So you remember we could simplify all the virus genomes to seven different types. So today we're going to simplify all the different kinds of viruses to two, maybe three types at the most. Before we start, <clears throat> some definitions, because I'll use all these terms a lot, and I want you to know what, <clears throat> what it means. A subunit, you know, when we talk about building a particle or a virus particle or a virion, we're going to talk about subunits. These are single polypeptides, and here, for example, are a couple of single polypeptides, VP1, VP2, VP3. VP is often used to describe these. They're virion proteins. And these are subunits because they fold up to make a structural unit. So a structural unit is the unit from which capsids or nucleocapsids are built. And we'll talk about a capsid and a nucleocapsid in a minute. But for example, when these three subunits come together, the blue, the yellow, and the red, uh, they form a structural unit which uh, you can see is here is made up of one of each. Now capsid is what we call this. This is the virus particle. That's poliovirus here, and that would be this. So this would be the polio capsid, the gray guy right here. And that's actually from the Latin for box. That's the protein shell surrounding the genome. So you can see inside of that would be the genome. The nucleocapsid is the nucleic acid protein assembly within the virion. So there are specific cases where we talk about nucleocapsid. So here, this rabies virus. Uh, this curly green uh, molecule, that's a nucleocapsid. It's, it's RNA bound to protein, all right? So it's always an RNA protein or a nucleic acid protein complex. In this retrovirus, the same thing, this green molecule is the nucleocapsid. Now poliovirus just has naked RNA inside of it, all right, in the upper right. That RNA is not a nucleocapsid because it doesn't have any protein associated with it. Uh, the envelope is what we call the membrane around uh, the particle. Here in this retrovirus, that's the envelope. Uh, here in rabies, that's the envelope right there. And these are, these are lipid membranes derived from the host cell. So we call them envelopes. And finally, the virion is the infectious virus particle. So whenever I say virion, I mean the infectious particle. Um, that's assumed that it's infectious. If you say virus particle, you're not, there's no assumption about infectivity. So this is a virion, a retrovirus virion in the lower right. This is a rabies virion. This is a polio virion. So that's, that's what we mean by these terminologies. <clears throat> now vir virion proteins, that is the proteins that make up the virion, the capsid that are embedded in the envelope, they have very specific functions. They're there to protect the genome. Each of these virus particles has a nucleic acid genome within it. So it, one function is to be a stable shell that protects it because viruses spend a lot of their time traveling between hosts or between cells, and the, the virion proteins protect it. As you'll see later, during assembly of new virus particles, the virion proteins have to recognize the nucleic acid and package it. Uh, and then for those viruses that have to form an envelope or that acquire an envelope during maturation, uh, the viral proteins, the structural proteins, have to be able to participate in that process. Uh, on the other side of things, these virion proteins, they do have to protect the genome, but they have to deliver it to the cell. In most cases, the genome either gets out of the particle or is, or is released in some way, and the virion proteins have to know how to do that. They have to bind cell receptors, which we'll talk about next time. They have to participate in uncoding, which is release of the genome into the cell. For some viruses that have membranes, these shown here, the membranes have to fuse with the cellular membrane. So in order for the genome to get from inside the particle to inside the cell, a fusion, a fusion event has to occur. That'll be the topic of, of the next lecture on Wednesday. And finally, um, the genome has to be brought to the right place in the cell. So it's not always deposited just underneath the plasma membrane. Sometimes it has to get deeper into the cytoplasm. 
Sometimes it has to go into the nucleus. And that depends, of course, on the nucleic acid, which is something you should be able to predict from the Baltimore scheme. Okay, so those are some of the functions of these viral proteins. Now, an important concept that is really important for you to understand is that, yeah, did you have a question? Yes. Um, back on slide three, can you say, can you tell me what uh, it means to form the envelope in the, in the last, uh, yeah. Interact with host cell membranes to form the envelope. So as we'll see later, when viruses with envelopes form, they usually uh, what we do what we call bud from a, a membrane in the cell. So the structural proteins form a unit and then this leaves the cell and it takes a piece of the membrane with it. It can be the plasma membrane, the ER, Golgi, even the nuclear membrane. So that's what budding means. And we'll, we'll look at that in very great detail next time. All right, so virions are metastable. I want you not to think of them as a passive particle that's simply taken up into the cell and opens up. I want you to think of them as a machine because they are machines, as you will see, they have moving parts and they do work, they expend energy. And this vir we, we say that virions are metastable because they have to be both stable and unstable. They have to be stable to protect the genome as it goes from cell to cell, but they also have to come apart quickly during infection to release the genome at the right trigger. So they're both stable and unstable. So here, for example, is a stable virion on the lower left. It's very good at protecting the genome. If this were polio, it would be good at protecting against low pH of the intestinal tract, all the proteases and bile acids that are present. Incredibly stable structure. But when it gets into the right cell, which is shown on the right, and upon the right triggers from that cell, which we will also talk about later, the virion has to become unstable and let the genome out. So that's why we call them uh, metastable. Now, in, in other terms, in, in energetic terms, um, they're metastable because they're not at their minimum free energy conformation. So on this graph, this is a graph of, of energy uh, versus time. And virions exist in the, in the first place here at an intermediate energy level. They would really like to get down to their minimum energy level three here, but there is usually a barrier to achieving that. So this is the virion. Number one is the virion as it passes from cell to cell and is stable and protects the, the genome. To get to three, it must get to three to release its nucleic acid. And to do that, it has to surmount this unfavorable uh, energy barrier. And that happens during entry, and the triggers are provided typically by the host cell. Right, so you can see a, a virion is not a passive uh, particle that is simply brought into the cell and releases its genome. So this energy barrier that the particle has to overcome to get to the minimum free energy, uh, as I said, is it is supplied by signals from the cell, the right receptor, the right intracellular environment. It could be low pH, it could be a protease that changes the particle in some way, but that's the right place for this to happen. The, the virus particle doesn't want to give up its genome in the wrong cell, so it depends on very specific cues. All right, so we say that virions are spring-loaded. This happens during assembly. We put energy into the structure, and then on the right signal, the virion pops open and gives up um, its genome. So the energy stored during assembly is, is expended during disassembly. And a, a good example or analogy for this are these uh, Japanese toys, Bakugan. Um, these are, my, my kids have these. These are Inside of each of these is a character, and when these balls roll over a piece of metal, they spring open. And the you can see the character, and it's part of a game, I think. But it's, just, it's the same analogy with a virus particle. The virus hits the right cell, it will spring open and release the genome. And you need energy to do that. And the energy was put into the particle during assembly and stored there, and then only when the virion hits the right cell, the right receptor, the right intracellular environments, Will it pop open and release the genome? Yes? Oh, what dictates the free energy for the virion? Is it uh, uh, entropy or thermodynamic? Uh, because when it breaks open, it seems that it disperses. So. Right, so all the energy stored into the bonds initially during assembly, that, is, that represents that, that free energy state that, that it exists. State. That's right. And then, and then when it uncoats, then it reaches the lower free energy state. 
Okay, so these are wonderful uh, little machines that, that uh, play an active process or an active role in disassembly. So when we talk about virions, there are two, two things we have to consider, both the structure and the function, because these are, these are wonderful designs. Uh, you know, if there were an architect designing these, it would be a perfect structure-function uh, relationship. So the virion has a structure that has evolved to play its role in all the things that we've said, protection, uncoding, and so forth. And the structure is created by taking many identical proteins and repeating them many times to give you maximum contact and non-covalent bonding. So here is, on the upper right is a typical virion. We, this one's made up of three different proteins repeated over and over. And these proteins have symmetrical interactions among themselves. That's how they can fit together into this nice shape but they're not covalently bound because if you covalently linked all these proteins they wouldn't be able to come apart well maybe they could but you'd have to put an awful lot of energy into them so you want non-covalent bonding so again many identical proteins repeated maximal contact non-covalent bonding and of course the function of the virion a, a big one is genome delivery and that can happen because the structure is not bonded together so the the uh, bonds that, the kind of interactions that link the proteins in the virion can come apart readily and they come apart again based on signals received in the host cell which we'll see next time. Alright, so that's the structure, how the structure is made and how it then can come apart to deliver the genome. So we're going to talk about the general ways that virions are put together but before we do, just to make sure um, we're on the same page, a little bit of uh, perspective on the sizes again. In the first lecture we talked about sizes involved in virus particles. Um, and remember, uh, we talk about nanometers quite often. An alpha helix of a protein is typically about a nanometer in diameter. Uh, DNA is two nanometers. And here is a poliovirus virion, 30 nanometers in diameter compared to a ribosome, which is about 20. So polio is a small virion. Remember, the biggest ones we know of are 750 nanometers. So you can see uh, not much bigger, really, 10 times bigger than, uh, or so than the diameter of a, of a DNA strand. The, the first reconstitution of a virus particle from its components was done with tobacco mosaic virus. A lot of firsts carried out. Remember, this is the first virus to be discovered. And what was done by these investigators in 1955 uh, was they purified the nucleic acid, which is RNA for this virus, they purified the coat protein. So this virion, which is shown here, remember it's a single rod-shaped virion. It's made up of a single coat protein repeated many times. And all those coat proteins engage in very similar interactions. So they mix the RNA and the coat protein and they spontaneously assemble to form the virion. And they, in fact, showed that that virus assembled from the components was infectious. So this was really the beginning of our, of our understanding of virus structure, that the components self-assemble. You can take them apart and you can put them back together again without any major changes. And this also, besides being the first virus discovered, the first one to be crystallized, as we'll see in a moment, and the first time that RNA was shown to be genetic material. Now, before we talk about structure, I just wanted to let you know how we study structure. There are a couple of very important tools, including electron microscopy, uh, X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, and NMR. We're going to talk about the first three here. Uh, the first pictures of uh, viruses were in 1940 by Helmuth Ruska, who used an electron microscope, which had been recently uh, developed uh, to take pictures of bacteriophages infecting uh, uh, a bacterium, probably E. coli. So you can see all the phages here. These are the, the typical tailed bacteriophages with a, a head and a, and a neck and tails that attach to the host. So there you go, that's the first paper. Now electron microscopy has revealed a great deal uh, about virus structure. Um, you have to stain the viruses in order to see them in electron microscope. Uh, viruses, of course, like many other biological materials, don't have any inherent contrast or not very much, so you have to apply a stain. Uh, 
in the case of an electron microscope, you have to have an electron dense stain, otherwise the electrons will go right through it. And so uh, typically what you do is use these uh, <coughs> electron dense materials, uranyl acetate, phosphotungstate, you coat the viruses with it, and then the electrons bounce off wherever the, the stain has surrounded the particle. Now the resolution that you can get with this is very good compared to light microscopy, about 50 to 75 angstroms. But remember, if an alpha helix is an angstrom and DNA is two angstroms in diameter, this is not going to give you any molecular information at all. It's just not high enough resolution. Uh, so no, we can't really look at detailed structures, but you can see the overall picture of the viruses. And in fact, for many years, uh, this formed our uh, idea of what viruses look like. So here's a collection of electron micrographs of various virus particles. You can see they're all very striking and very different. Perhaps the most striking is the adenovirus. It's an icosahedral capsid. We'll, we'll see what that means in a moment. With these interesting projections, looks like Sputnik in a way coming off. Uh, here are hepatitis B virus particles. The infectious viruses are these spherical ones here, and these elongated ones are, are non-infectious particles. Here's a herpes virus. Uh, here are some influenza viruses and polioviruses up here, and this is a pox virus. So you see all, all sorts of different shapes, but we'll be able to actually classify these into three different categories as we go on here. So the electron micrograph gives you a overall view of the particle. You can see which ones are similar and which ones are different, but we don't get any structural information. And to do that, you need to use other methods. Uh, a very common method being used today is cryo-electron microscopy. So what you do here is you use an electron microscope, but you don't stain the particles with an electron-dense dye, because that is what really prevents you from getting high resolution. What you do is you, you take purified virus particles and you freeze them in water. And that gives enough contrast to the particles that you can photograph them. And you can see on the upper left, this is a, a micrograph, an electron micrograph of some virus particles that are just frozen in water. So you can see there's just enough contrast there. Then what you do is you scan them in a computer. You scan about, you scan thousands of different images. And the idea is that each image is present in a slightly different orientation. And then you use computer programs to take all those images and assemble a three-dimensional reconstruction, we call it. So it's sort of like a CAT scan where x-rays are taken in three dimensions and then they're assembled into a three-dimensional view. It's the same thing here. You take many views of the virus particles and then you do what's <coughs> called a three-dimensional reconstruction. And you can get pretty good resolutions here. Initially, the technique gave about 20 angstroms, and today you can get uh, down to three. And really what is now driving the increased resolution here is com computational approaches, high-speed computers and sophisticated <coughs> software that can interpret these, uh, these, this information. So this is an example of, a, of an image that you can get from cryo-EM reconstruction. This is poliovirus bound to its cellular receptor, which is called CD155. So here in red is the virion, and the green molecules are the receptor molecules bound to it. So you can see, you can get an overall view of the structure. You can certainly see individual receptor molecules and where they bind in the virus capsid. And this uh, resolution was, I think, about 10 angstroms. So you can't see individual polypeptide chains, but you can get an idea of, of how things fit into each other. So this can be quite powerful. The most high resolution um, approach is X-ray crystallography. You grow up and purify your virus and find empirically conditions that give you a crystal. So visible crystals of your virus as shown here. And then you bombard them with X-rays and then the X-rays will hit the atoms in the crystal and reflect and you collect all the reflections on a scanner and then you interpret them in terms of the three-dimensional structure. And so eventually you can get resolutions to two or three angstroms, actually less than two angstroms now. So you can see the complete polypeptide chain, the alpha carbon backbone, all the side chains. You can do very high detailed structural analysis of this. <coughs> so the, 
crystallography world in terms of viruses began in 1935. Stanley crystallized tobacco mosaic virus. He grew up the crystals. He showed that they were infectious. He couldn't solve the structure though because a virus is such a big assembly of proteins that no one had the computational power to be able to do that until the 1970s. So other proteins structures were solved at high resolution by x-ray crystallography, but viruses could not be because they required advanced computing. And so it wasn't until 1978 the first x-ray structure of a virus was solved, and that's shown here. It's a plant virus, TBSV, uh, and this was at, at about two or three angstroms resolution. So this view here is a low resolution image, but the x-ray data gives you the XYZ coordinate of every atom in the particle. So you can see, you can trace the polypeptide chains and see exactly how all the subunits interact. So this, of course, helps us to really understand virus structure. So here is the structure of poliovirus in two different views, so you can contrast two methods. So on the right is the structure by 3D reconstruction from cryo-EM data. So that's about a 10 angstrom resolution. So again, you can't see the polypeptide chains, but you can see the shape of the particle. You can see it's got some sur interesting surface features, which will make sense in a bit. And here on the upper left is the x-ray structure, and that's about 1.8 angstrom. So here you can see every polypeptide chain. Now we've zoomed out so much uh, that you can't see any details, but each of these little lines is the alpha carbon backbone of the polypeptide. So you could display this in any way you want using your computer and your display modules, but you could zoom in on a particular area that you're interested in and see all of the amino acids how they interact within the particle. And of course, if you're adding a receptor to this, you could see how that interacts with it as well. So these are the tools of structural biology, and this helps us to understand how, how viruses are built. Now, uh, as we now move into understanding the principles of virus construction, um, we'll go back to this idea that we brought up initially, and that is symmetry. Symmetry is the key to building virus particles because, in general, their genomes aren't so big. They can't encode a lot of proteins, so they have to use genetic economy, which means they have to repeat subunits over and over. Now, all of this came about really beginning uh, with the work of Watson and Crick. Now, you, you may know Watson and Crick as having figured out the structure of DNA in 1953, but in fact, they made a huge contribution to uh, our understanding a virus structure. Back in 1956, so they had, they had figured out the structure of DNA, they moved on to other things. They uh, wrote a paper in which they said, you know, uh, most of the viruses that we look at under the EM, so all the data we had so far was from EM, they're either spherical or they're rod-shaped. So here we have a spherical poliovirus particle down there on the table in gray. And a, a rod-shaped particle would be like tobacco mosaic virus, right? So of all the EMs of viruses that had been done, they pretty much fell into those two categories. And they also knew by, from biochemical studies that had been done, that is you purify a virus, you break it up, you run it on a protein gel, and you count how many proteins are present, that the viruses are made with many copies of a few proteins. So let's say you purified poliovirus, and you broke it up and you ran it on a protein gel, you would find four proteins. And their molar amounts would tell you that they are repeated many times uh, to form the virus particle. Finally, they reasoned that um, viral proteins must have properties, structural properties, which are unique to virus structural proteins, that allow them to interact with each other in a symmetrical way. Okay, so those three points they made. And from their work, what we know now is that uh, what, how viruses are built are using two kinds of symmetry, either helical symmetry for rod-shaped viruses or polyhedral symmetry for round viruses, and we'll talk about this in, in detail in a moment. So you take identical protein subunits and you repeat them many times, either in a helical fashion or in, an, in a, a polyhedral fashion. So that's what Watson and Crick uh, gave to structural virology. And from their work, there came these rules of symmetry, which tell you how to make a virus particle. And there are just two rules. 
The first rule is that each subunit in the particle has identical bonding with its neighbors. So if you have two proteins, the same protein repeated twice, the interactions of those two proteins will be the same no matter where you are in the virus particle. So identical bonding. And this gives you a symmetrical arrangement of, of proteins in the capsid. You repeat the same subunit over and over. You have in identical uh, interactions throughout the particle. Gives you a symmetrical particle. All right, so identical bonding contacts. Rule two, the contacts are typically non-covalent. And that means it's, it can be a reversible reaction, which you need on encoding. But maybe even more importantly, or as importantly, while you are assembling a particle, if it's not assembling properly, you can disassemble it and redo it. And there, there are quality control measures that uh, are carried out during infection that monitor this and that tell you, oh, this capsid isn't put together right, let's disassemble it. So that you can do that because the bonds are non-covalent. Right? So those are the two symmetry rules for building particles. Now these symmetry rules we're going to talk about in a moment, but they have turned out to be practically useful for us. They're great for viruses, of course, because viruses build capsids that allow them to transport genomes. But we have taken advantage of this to make vaccines. Uh, so for example, we found out that if you, let's say a virus is made from one capsid protein. Uh, the human papillomaviruses are made from one capsid protein. You can express that capsid protein by itself in a cell and it will assemble into virus proteins. That is because once the protein is made in the cell, it folds in a certain way that is made to interact with, with like proteins. So it finds uh, similar proteins in the cell, they all interact with one another, and they form a shell. So we call these virus-like particles because they only have protein, they don't contain any nucleic acid. And you can imagine that for a vaccine, this might be useful. If you don't have nucleic acid present, it's not going to be infectious, yet it will be immunogenic. So the, the hepatitis B virus vaccines and the human papillomavirus vaccines that are made and sold today are made up of uh, uh, virus-like particles, either in yeast or in other cell systems. And again, that's because all the information for making the particle is embodied in the protein. You make one protein, it will then fold properly and assemble with all other versions of itself to form uh, a particle. All right, so back to the two kinds of symmetry by which virions are built. The first one is helical symmetry. And this is a, a simple way of building a particle. You typically take one kind of structural protein and that protein interacts with other versions of itself uh, and forms a long structure like the ones that are shown here. So typically the, the protein subunits are called code proteins and they interact with each other in identical ways and they also interact with the viral genome. So here on the top is what the tobacco mosaic virus capsid looks like. It is a rod shaped structure as you've seen from a couple of the EMs that I've shown you and it's composed of a single coat protein repeated many times that binds to the RNA in a helical fashion. You can see here it's twisting around and continues down the rod. And the protein is interacting with the RNA and each subunit interacts with its neighbors in exactly the same way as well. So that gives you symmetry. And the particular kind of symmetry is helical because these structures twist around uh, in a helical fashion. So that's tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, here's an EM of it again, just to remind you. Uh, these are just, these are really naked uh, RNAs with the protein twisted around it. And that's how they infect plants. Now there are versions of these viruses or this kind of helical structure in viruses that infect animals. Here's an example of that. Sendai virus is a paramyxovirus related to measles virus. Uh, its nucleocapsid is also made up of a single protein, again, that interacts with itself and with the RNA. This is a bit longer than the TMV capsid. And this would, by the way, be called a nucleocapsid, both of these because the RNA and protein interaction. Now, uh, here on the lower right is a photograph of a measles virus particle. And again, this is related to Sendai. The measles virus nucleocapsid is helical as well. And you can see this virus particle is broken. Uh, 
So the dye, the EM dye, has been able to get into the particle and it's staining the nucleocapsids here. So you can see these are these helical structures just like those uh, shown here. And this is the rabies virus or a, a relative of rabies, vesicular stomatitis virus nucleocapsid. Again, a single protein arranged in a helical fashion with the viral RNA inside. Now the animal viruses that have helical nucleocapsids all are enveloped, at least the ones we know of. So these are not existing naked in the environment as is TMV. Uh, these nucleocapsids would have an envelope around them. Now this is again the um, helical tobacco mosaic virus and if you've ever seen these buckyballs, which unfortunately you can't buy anymore, but they are, they're little magnetic balls and someone gave these to me uh, a long time ago and a couple of years ago your TA Ashley was sitting in my office and she was looking at them. She said, do you know you can build a helical nucleocapsid with these? I said, no. And so you can, in fact, and that's shown here. So this is a nice strand of magnets, but you could look at each one of them as a capsid subunit. They're all identical and they're all interacting with each other in identical manners. And this forms a perfect tobacco mosaic virus, if you will. The only thing missing, of course, uh, is the viral RNA. And the way this assembles is probably the way the capsid would assemble in cells. The proteins form a, a long strand bound to the RNA that then coils up uh, into the structure. So it's really neat uh, and I have this to this day on my desk and it's always sitting right there and never fair. Whoever sits there starts playing with it and disassembles and reassembles it. It's really, uh, really quite addictive but it's, it illustrates this principle of helical symmetry very nicely. Now, this is a molecular view of a nucleocapsid of a, a vesicular stomatitis virus shown up here, again, related to rabies virus. Again, these are uh, viral RNA complexed with the uh, nuclear protein forming a helical structure. It's opened up a little bit in this diagram, but it would be very tight as shown in the previous uh, movie. And that whole thing is surrounded by an envelope, uh, which in turn is full of glycoproteins. We'll talk about that in a moment. So the, the protein, again, that makes up the subunit of this nucleocapsid is called the N or nucleocapsid protein. Here's the structure of it. And this is the X-ray structure of the protein bound to a short RNA of nine nucleotides. So you can see this N protein binds a very specific sequence. Uh, I should say it binds RNA in a very specific part of the protein. The RNA interaction is actually not sequence specific. And that's why these can coat the entire genome. But what happens is when you put multiple of these N protein molecules together, you see in this structure on the left, they've begun to form a helical structure. It's the first circle. Here is an RNA inside this green molecule and each uh, N protein is binding a, an adjacent part of the RNA. So that's how these nucleocapsids form. So here are some examples of viruses that infect uh, animals that have helical nucleocapsids, right? So remember, these all have an envelope. Inside is the genome, which is bound to one protein in this helical fashion that we've just been talking about. Uh, so for example, measles virus and rabies virus, even influenza virus and the Ebola virus here. All of their genomes are arranged as a nucleocapsid with helical symmetry and it's packaged uh, within the envelope virus particle. So as I said before, none of the animal viruses with helical symmetry have naked helical genomes. They all have an envelope around them. Okay, so those are these rod-shaped viruses. And even, we then learned that even some spherical viruses could be built with um, helical symmetry. For example, the influenza viruses have helical nucleocapsids and they're roughly spherical. But there are other kinds of viruses that don't have envelopes, like, like poliovirus, which in an electron micrograph is a spherical particle and that that EM is an EM of polioviruses and you can see they they look roughly spherical. So back in the 50s and 60s when people were trying to figure out uh, virus structure the question was how do you make a spherical virion from individual proteins that have irregular shapes because we knew from what protein structures we had Proteins have irregular shapes, and how would you put them together to make a round virus particle? 
And here are two clues that eventually gave way to our understanding of this, the answer to this. First, all the round capsids, all the viruses with round capsids, like polioviruses and, and others, have precise numbers of proteins, always an exact number. They turned out to be multiple of 60. So it wasn't an, an odd number of proteins making up these viruses, always a very precise number, 60, 180, 240, 960, and even more. And clue number two, uh, the spherical viruses could be very small, like polio, 30 nanometers in diameter, or they could be very big. Yet the capsid proteins are always roughly 20 to 60,000 Daltons in molecular weight. Okay, so virus, virus capsids are made of fixed multiples of 60, and the capsid proteins never get too big. So this gave a lot of clues about how you would build these round viruses. And in particular, two uh, structural biologists, Casper uh, and Klug, thought about this a long time, did a number of experiments, and they figured out the solution. That is how you build a round capsid from irregular proteins. And they knew from, from Watson and Crick's work, which we talked about, that these round capsids are actually icosahedrons. And it was never any other kind of platonic solid. It was always an icosahedron, which was very interesting. They also found from their structural work that the subunits that made up the particles were tended to be arranged in groups of five or groups of six, which we call pentamers or hexamers. And then finally, the number of subunits, as I told you before, were multiples of 60. And these are called T numbers, which we'll explain in a moment. And again, there was nothing in between. So they devised a, a series of rules for building these round capsids using what's called icosahedral symmetry. And that's what uh, this poliovirus sitting down here is built with. And you can just see some of the traces of icosahedral symmetry on this plush toy here. So an icosahedron, of course, is a solid. It has 20 faces. Each face is an equilateral triangle. And uh, this allows you to make a closed shell with as little as 60 single proteins. You could take 60 identical protein subunits and build an icosahedron with it. And it turns out that this is the best way to make a closed shell with the smallest number of proteins that's going to be very stable. None of the other solids work. So here's an icosahedron. And um, in this simplest one, you can imagine that each of the triangles is a single protein. So we have, because of the repeated nature uh, of the subunits in icosahedral, you have what are called uh, rotational axes of symmetry. And there's a five-fold axis around which there are five copies of the subunit. There are three-fold axes and two-fold axes, and those are shown here on the bottom as well. And we'll talk about axes of symmetry a lot in this course. I'll say here at the five-fold axis of symmetry, you can see this interaction, and that's all that we mean. It's simply the axis around which there are five or three or two copies of the <coughs> subunit. So let's look at how you build uh, virus particles with this kind of symmetry. Now, to do that, we have to learn about the triangulation number or the T number. And there are, there are a number of ways that you can look at it. There's actually a, a mathematical approximation of this. But I think the, the easiest way is to define it as the number of facets for each triangular face of the icosahedron. Remember, the icosahedron is made up of a dozen triangular faces. So here would be an example of one triangular face of an icosahedron. And this, this is a T equals one virus particle because it's made up of one uh, triangular face. <coughs> Here is a T equals four, and now you can see we've expanded the triangular face to include four facets, one, two, three, four. So you look at it in, as sort of a, a jewel in a way. So instead of having a flat face of each triangle and a T equals one, you now break it up into facets. Uh, and in this case, you have four. And so this turns out to be the way you build bigger and bigger particles. You start with a small t equals one <coughs> icosahedron. You can make small particles. But if you want to make bigger ones, you just add more triangular facets. And those mimi viruses, which are the biggest, have over a 1,000 triangular 
facets in each equilateral triangle that makes up the icosahedron. All right, so that's all that a T number is. It's just the number of facets per each triangular face. There's one facet here, there's four here. <coughs> so here is a simple icosahedral virus. It's a T equals one. It's made of 60 identical protein subunits and each of those is shown as a comma here. And there's one facet per each triangular face. And all of these molecules, so these, each comma here is a single identical protein subunit. They all interact equally throughout the particle. So all the interactions are symmetrical. Head to head, tail to tail, et cetera. They're all exactly equivalent uh, throughout the particle. So that's the simplest example. And here's an illustration of one virus with this kind of structure. T equals one symmetry built with 60 copies of a single capsid. So it's one protein repeated 60 times. You could build this wonderful stable capsid. It's really amazing. So here's the capsid protein up here. You repeat it 60 times. You get the adeno-associated virus 2 virion or parvovirus, the uh, virus that can infect your, your pets. Um, and that's built with this very simple symmetry. So this is a small virus particle. It's about the same size as, as poliovirus. So how do you make a bigger one? You add more subunits to each triangular face. You don't use bigger proteins because remember the virus capsid proteins are only 20 to 60 kilodaltons inside. So you don't make bigger proteins. You just increase the number of them in the capsids. So let's, let's look at that. Now, when we do that, when you start putting more capsid subunits in to make a bigger particle, you violate the symmetry rules that Casper and Klug originally thought up. Now they said that the way to build a particle is, is to use icosahedral symmetry and you take one or a few different viral proteins and you repeat them many times and all the interactions are the same no matter where you are in the particle. The problem is when you start adding additional subunits in they're not all the same interactions anymore and we have so Casper and Klug modified their theory to say well they are interact in a quasi-equivalent fashion. They're similar, but not identical. So anytime you have more than 60 subunits, you, you run into this problem that all the interactions are not going to be the same anymore. So you have uh, different structural environments, similar interactions, but not identical. So that's what quasi-equivalence means. Let's, let's take a look at how that works. So here is a T equals three uh, virion. And this is, a, we've now made three uh, facets to each icosahedral face or triangle. We've made a bigger virus particle, so now we have 180 protein subunits. This particular virus, each subunit is still the same protein. We've just added more per triangular face, and we can make a bigger particle. And as a result now, you get three different kinds of subunit packing. The orange, the yellow, and the purple subunits have slightly different kinds of interactions you get what are called pentamers and hexamers. You can see here there are groups of five. Here, one, two, three, four, five. But here there's a group of six. And that's what happens when you add more subunits. You get pentamer and hexamer type interactions on the capsid. So you can see there's no way, just by looking at the pentamer and hexamer arrangement, there's no way that the interactions could be equivalent any longer. That's why we say they're quasi-equivalent. They are uh, in similar interactions like head to head or tail to tail, but there are local bonding differences. So that's how you make a bigger virus with, without completely violating the, the symmetry rules. So here's an example of a T equals three virus. It's an insect virus. It has 180 copies of a single capsid protein. Uh, here it is in, in the triangular face here. And this is slightly bigger than the adeno-associated virus because we've gone from 60 to 180 subunits. But the same principles uh, apply. These are arranged with icosahedral symmetry. And all the interactions are similar, but they're not identical. <coughs> so this is a summary of, T, of uh, the T number, just to sort of emphasize what this is. <coughs> and these are three different viruses with three different T numbers. Here's T equals one. Remember, there's one facet in the triangular face. Uh, and so if you, if you look at this as the, one of the triangular faces here, 
it only has one facet. It's got the minimum number of proteins, 60, to make up the particle. Here is a T equals 3, where you've now inserted three facets into each triangular face, one versus three here. You can now make a bigger virus particle. And you can always calculate the number of subunits by multiplying 60 times the T number. So we know this is 180 subunits, the one we just looked at. And here's a T equals four virus particle. And now you can see the facet has been divided into, the face has been divided into four facets, one, two, three, four. So now you can get a virus with 240 subunits. And you can go on and on, T equals seven, etc. Some numbers are not allowed by the rules of symmetry. We never see them, but they can go very high. They can go up into over a thousand. So that brings us to this cartoon, uh, which I can't resist showing to you. It's Foxtrot, and uh, it's just totally relevant to this lecture. It's this two guys, what are you looking at? Viral videos, like Star Wars Kid and Numa Numa, electron microscope analysis of a human picornavirus. We must get different emails. See how the capsid is icosahedral in shape. So I didn't talk to Bill or, uh, Amend. He must have picked this up somewhere on his own, but he's got it right. Um, you can even see the icosahedral uh, shape in an in electron microscope. And that's what this is. This is a picornavirus, and you can see there's a five-fold axis of symmetry on it. So they've got it almost right here. All right, now when you you can make even bigger viruses. And when you do that, it, you use the same rules. You add subunits to each triangular face of the icosahedron. But it turns out as you make bigger and bigger particles, you have to have other proteins in there as well to manage the size, all right? And so that's what we're showing here. The largest viruses have different components. In addition to the ones that make up the shell, they have different proteins that serve different functions. So here, for example, is adenovirus, which is quite a large uh, virus particle. Uh, it's got two different kinds of structural units, the hexon and the penton, uh, and these form the capsid shell. So those two proteins forms the, form the pentons and the hexons in the shell that give you the icosahedral shape. But you can see all of these other proteins, these are all structural proteins that are present in the virion, they have different roles. They don't form the shell. Some of them attach to the receptor. Some are, some are called glue. They, they hold the shell together. This is what stabilization means. And some of the proteins are involved in packing the DNA inside the shell. So what I want you to understand is that we can build wonderful icosahedra by taking a few one or a few proteins and repeating them, at a certain point, you've got to add other proteins in there for different functions as well. And adenovirus is a good example of that. So here is a uh, analysis of adenovirus. Here's an electron micrograph. That's the famous one with, with, the, with the Sputnik look. So adenovirus is an icosahedral capsid about 150 nanometers in diameter. The T number is 25. So there are 25 <laughs> facets for each triangular icosahedral face. It's made up of 240 subunits, made up of uh, hexons and pentons. And you can see the icosahedral arrangement here. So the pentons, the five associated subunits, are at each five-fold axis, and then the hexons are in between. Uh, it also has these additional proteins at each five-fold axis, these fibers and knobs at the end. So at each of the 12 five-fold axes, there's one of these fibers with a little tip, and that's what attaches to the cell receptor. So this doesn't contribute to the basic shell structure of the virus particle, but is an accessory protein needed to attach to a cell receptor. Then there are all sorts of other proteins in here as well. You can see some of these uh, lines here in between the hexons. Those are these so-called glue proteins that are thought to have to hold these proteins together. And then in the interior of the capsid where there's viral DNA, uh, there are proteins that bind the DNA and serve, serve various roles uh, in, in keeping the DNA there. So that's one example of how when you make a more complicated capsid, you have to have other proteins as well. Here's an interesting example of two concentric icosahedral capsids. So the real viruses, T equals 13, 13 facets per icosahedral face. Um, these are viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes. And they're made up of two 
icosahedral shells. So there's an inner shell, and then wrapped around it uh, is an outer shell. Uh, and you'll see later that these uh, viruses actually never uh, get rid of their genome during infection. So this is a very stable particle, and in fact, many of these viruses uh, infect our alimentary tracts, and maybe that's why you need a double-shelled genome. But there's nothing more than two uh, icosahedral shells, one wrapped around each other. <clears throat> now sometimes, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you can add another component to these virions, right? We talked about helical symmetry and icosahedral symmetry. You can add an envelope on top of that. So you can take the helical genome of the rabies virus, you put an envelope on it, and that's the infectious virus particle. And the envelope is, is derived from the host cell, um, and it has to, the virus has to get it from the host cell because viruses can't make their own lipids. And as I said before, these are acquired by budding. So this is the budding process summarized here. Uh, the viral components are placed, in this case, near the plasma membrane. And then the whole membrane buds out. And eventually, this bud pinches off to, to form a particle. And so the, you can see the membrane, in this case, is derived from the plasma membrane. So here we have a <clears throat> nucleocapsid. So there's RNA and protein right in there. And then that's wrapped up uh, in an envelope. So this is actually a retrovirus, which of course is what HIV is. So the, this little uh, giant microbe, HIV, is, is shown as an icosahedron. You can see the five-fold axis of symmetry here. So that's why I said this isn't right, because retroviruses don't have, they have an envelope on the outside. They don't have icosahedral symmetry if you just look at the particles. They would look something like this. <coughs> So here are some examples of envelopes on virus particles. So on the upper left is a rabies virus. So remember, the, the genome is a nucleocapsid. It's RNA plus protein. So there's a single RNA in there, and it's, and it's interacting with many copies of the nucleoprotein. And it forms this helical structure. Remember the magnetic beads? Those are all wrapped up inside an envelope in a bullet shape. So here's the envelope surrounding the nucleocapsid. Ebola virus on the right here is a similar structure except it's filamentous. These are so-called filoviruses or phyloviruses uh, from the Greek word thread, so because they have this thread-like appearance. They're nothing more than a nucleocapsid, again, RNA and protein. Here's the RNA and here are the protein subunits coiled up inside of an envelope, which in this case happens to be elongated. So these are two examples of helical nucleocapsids that can be enveloped. You can also have an icosahedral capsid within an envelope. So you could take this kind of structure with RNA in it and put an envelope around it, and that's what's shown here. Uh, this is a virus related to yellow fever virus. It's got an icosahedral shell. The RNA is inside, but then there's a membrane around it as well. So membranes can go over both kinds of capsids, icosahedral or uh, helical nucleocapsids. Now, whenever a virus has an envelope around it, it also puts proteins of its own in the envelope. And these are called viral envelope glycoproteins. These are typical integral membrane glycoproteins. They, they're shown schematically here on the right. So here's the envelope of the virus particle. It's a typical lipid bilayer. And these are viral glycoproteins. They pass through the envelopes. Uh, typically, they have sequences that are in the interior of the virion. They have external <coughs> sequences as well. And these external sequences are very important. They, they bind receptors, so they can dictate cell specificity. And when you make antibodies against viruses, they are typically directed against these external domains of these glycoproteins. Now, when you look at a virus particle that's enveloped and has these glycoproteins in them, it looks something like this. These are influenza viruses. And you can see in these EMs, it looks like they have spikes on the surface, right? Each of those is an individual viral glycoprotein. So you will sometimes hear these referred to as spikes. And that's why, because of the early uh, electron micrographs. These envelope glycoproteins can be sticking up perpendicular to the membrane. So here on the left is an example of the influenza virus glycoprotein. It's embedded in the viral membrane. This is called the hemagglutinin. And this is an extremely important uh, vir 
protein for the virus. Without it, it would not be infectious. As you'll see, it, it's what is used to attach to the cell receptor. Other viral glycoproteins can be arrayed parallel to the membrane, like this flavivirus uh, glycoprotein. And they both work to attach to cell receptors. Yes? Are these proteins attached to anything within, uh, below the viral? Yes, yeah, sometimes they are. Sometimes they are attached to other viral components. I think I have a slide of that. And here it is, right here. So the question was, are there interactions of these glycoproteins with viral proteins? And the answer is yes, and they can occur in several ways, as shown on this slide. So here is a schematic of a viral membrane. So these are each showing cutaways of virus particles. So here and here in yellow are the viral glycoproteins. So you can see they're passing through the membrane. In this case, uh, they're interacting with, directly with a capsid. So we've taken a capsid and put an envelope on it. These glycoproteins are interacting with the capsid. Sometimes there is a, um, a protein in between the capsid and the envelope called an M or a matrix protein, and the glycoproteins can interact with that. And sometimes there's a more complex layer on top of the capsid or nucleocapsids in the glycoprotein. So in most cases, there is some kind of interaction which is probably needed for structural integrity of the particles. Now, in, when you do put an envelope uh, on, a, on a virus like this, depending on what's underneath, the, the envelope can actually have structure or not. And so here's an example of a structured, a virus with what we call a structured envelope. This is Synbis virus, a plus strand RNA virus that is typically transmitted by a vector. And the, this virus actually consists of an icosahedral capsid with a envelope on the surface. And uh, in, this, in this cross section, uh, you can see the icosahedral capsid right below here in orange. So here are the glycoproteins in blue. The green is the viral membrane. So the glycoproteins are passing through the viral membrane and they're interacting with the icosahedral shell. The result of this is that if you look at these particles in the EM, it looks like the glycoproteins have icosahedral symmetry. So there's a five and a three and a two-fold axis of symmetry. That's because the glycoproteins are assuming the symmetry of the underlying icosahedral shell. That's because the interactions between uh, the glycoproteins and the shell are so specific. So that's what we call a structured envelope where the glycoproteins look like they have icosahedral symmetry simply because of the underlying capsid. Uh, many virions of this kind are not structured. Influenza virus, rabies virus, uh, retroviruses. The glycoproteins float in the lipid envelope and they don't have any structure whatsoever. If you just look at them, they just look like a sea of spikes. And that is because they're not being aligned by any underlying symmetry. They're simply a, a nucleocapsid uh, which is the RNA genome, of course. Uh, let's look at just one other large virus, just to give you a sense of how these are built. These are herpes viruses. Uh, herpes viruses uh, have about 80 viral genes encoding in their GNA genomes, and over half of them go towards building the capsid. Capsid is 2,000 angstroms in diameter, contains 13 envelope proteins. Uh, there are four proteins that make up the icosahedral capsid, and then there's what's called a tegument made up of 20 proteins, which is between the envelope and the icosahedron. So here is a cross-section. This is a cryo-EM reconstruction of herpes virus. You can see the icosahedral capsid in light blue, and then there's a, an envelope surrounding it in dark blue, and then there are glycoproteins in the envelope. So this is a very big capsid, uh, there, are quite a, there are four proteins that make it up. Uh, there are 13 glycoproteins embedded in the envelope. And then this orange is the tegument. It's a layer of protein between the capsid and the envelope made up of 20 different proteins that has a variety of functions during infection. This is a very interesting particle because, as I said, it's built with icosahedral symmetry. There's a cryo-EM reconstruction of the particle. But remember, in an icosahedral structure, there are five-fold axes of symmetry. And in theory, they're all the same. They all have the same environment. But on the herpes capsid, one of them is different. And you can see it here. One of the five-fold axes of the herpes capsid has what's called a portal. It's an opening. 
None of the other fivefold axes have that. So remember, there are 12 fivefold axes in all. One of them on the herpes caps, it has a portal. You can see it in this electron micrograph. That's a reconstruction of it. Uh, here's a top view of it. And it's believed that this is how you put DNA into the capsid and perhaps get it out. So at some point you have to put DNA in while you're building the capsid, and at some point you have to get it out as well. So interesting way of, uh, of a spin on icosahedral symmetry is to make this asymmetrical portal. <clears throat> Phages are really interesting in their structures. They are nothing more than an agglomeration of all the things we've talked about. Here is the famous uh, tailed bacteriophage, which you've all seen photographs of. It consists nothing more than a icosahedral head. So the head is built with icosahedral symmetry. It has five-fold axes of symmetry, just as we've been talking about. The neck is made up of a helical structure, very much like the helical nucleocapsids that we've been talking about. And then there's some specialized proteins that are involved in infection, very much like the specialized proteins of adenovirus. You have a base plate, which is involved in sitting down on the host, binding to a receptor, and poking a hole in the host, in some cases, to let the nucleic acid in. And then there's these tail fibers, which are also involved in recognizing the host as well. So the nucleic acid of this tailed phage is contained within the head. And then when the phage finds the right cell, on the right signals, uh, the, the hole is poked in, uh, the cell and then the DNA is ejected. It turns out the DNA is packaged in this head at very, very high pressure and it comes shooting out at just the right signal. Now just last year, a detailed structure of this base plate was solved and it turned out to have a spike in it. Okay, so here's the base plate. We're now looking at the bottom of that, of the end of that tail of one of these phages and this is the spike. And the idea is that when this, again, when this phage hits the right cell, this spike jams into the cell membrane of the bacteria and makes a hole through which the nucleic acid can go through. And so a group solved the structure of this spike at X-ray resolution, you know, 1.8 angstroms. And here it is on the right. And you can see this is a, uh, this is a multimer made up of, I think, three different copies of a polypeptide. And look how it makes a real spike. These, these are uh, beta strands, of course, forming uh, the structure from a broad top down to the tip. And this is the tip of the spike that will shoot into the host cell. And these proteins are coordinated by an iron atom uh, right here. And so that's why they call this an iron-loaded spike. So the idea is that this gets jammed into the bacterium, it makes a hole, and then somehow must fall off to allow uh, the DNA to go through. But I, I just think this is a remarkable structure because it looks exactly what you think it would look like, a spike for, for driving through the membrane. This is a mimivirus whose structure was solved a couple of years ago by cryo-EM. It's huge. Remember, these are 750 nanometers in diameter. It's icosahedral, as you can see. You can probably recognize uh, five-fold axes of symmetry. But it has this really unusual star on one side of the particle. And that was deduced from the cryo-EM. You can see it's not on the other sides, it's just here. Now we don't know what it is, but maybe it's a door. Maybe it opens up to let the genome out. Inside, this is the DNA genome. It's quite big, as you know, and this could be a portal. I think that the really amazing thing is the T number for this particle. 1,179. There are 1,179 facets for each triangular icosahedral face. I think that's remarkable. Now, in particles, there are a bunch of other things that are important for virus replication. There can be enzymes of all sorts, the various polymerases, proteases, enzymes that cap messenger RNA, topoisomerases, uh, activators of transcription, things that degrade mRNA, histones, tRNAs. Many, many things have been found inside virus particles. So I, I don't want you to leave thinking that it's just structural proteins and some glycoproteins. And we will touch on a lot of these as we continue our discussion. And I wanted to point out uh, two of them that are very interesting. Uh, one, in the capsid of picornaviruses, there's a small lipid present. And so here is the uh, X-ray structure of poliovirus at 1.8 angstroms resolution. And you can see these yellow molecules are uh, where there's a small lipid present in the particle. And there's one per subunit, 
or uh, 60 times 3, which is the t equals 3 virus, 180 copies of this lipid. There is actually a drug that uh, has been uh, isolated based on its antiviral property that displaces the lipid in this pocket. And here's the pocket where the lipid normally sits, and this is the drug that's fit into it. So this is a drug that had been developed by several companies in an attempt to make antivirals against common cold viruses. And they never were clinically useful because resistance emerged too rapidly, but they turned out to be very important because they revealed the presence of this pore and they showed that the presence of the lipid is essential for uncoating. So a lipid is normally present here and we'll talk about next time how it functions, but it's an example of how another kind of a chemical component is present and has functions uh, in a virion. And the other uh, molecule I wanted to tell you about is in the influenza virus virion. So remember influenza viruses are envelope virus particles. They have glycoproteins in the envelope, as you would expect. Um, and the RNA genome is inside, wrapped up in a nucleocapsid RNA plus protein. So in the envelope, we have three different kinds of proteins. We have a hemagglutinin, which I showed you earlier. This is the protein that attaches to cell receptors. Uh, we have a neuraminidase, which is an enzyme, and we'll talk about its function later on. But then there is a third protein and that's called the M2 protein. It's a very small protein and it's present only in a few copies per virion. This turns out to be an ion channel. And it's the smallest known ion channel. In other words, it pumps ions uh, from the outside of the virion into the interior. It actually pumps protons. And we'll talk about uh, the role of this during infection next time. But you can see this is a model of this M M2 ion channel in the influenza virus membrane. So this would be the viral membrane, phospholipid bilayer. This is a tetramer. This short uh, protein forms a tetramer, which makes an ion channel in the membrane. So those are two examples of other kinds of proteins that are present, which contribute to virion uh, function. All right, that's it for today.